Hello, happy Sunday. Welcome to St. Peter's Church. It's the 25th of August, 2024, and you're here to hear my reflection for this Sunday. I'm Reverend Sue Lynn Milne, and I'm the rector. Now you'll notice, probably, if you've watched before, I'm doing it different. I'm filming on portrait mode. That's because I'm one of those unusual Anglicans that likes change. I get bored doing things the same way all the time. So here we go. I've gone, I'm re being rebellious and gone off the wall today, and I'm filming in portrait mode. So there we are. So my reflection is going to be on a particular matter, but I will be referring slightly to the epistle reading from the lectionary for this week. So I'm going to read that to you uh, as a beginning. So I'm reading from Ephesians chapter six, starting at verse 10. A final word, be strong with the Lord's mighty power. Put on all of God's armour so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies and tricks of the devil. For we're not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against those mighty powers of darkness who rule this world, and against wicked spirits in the heavenly realms. Use every piece of God's armour to resist the enemy in, in the time of evil, so that after the battle you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the sturdy belt of truth and the body armour of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In every battle you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times and on every occasion in the power of the Holy Spirit. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all Christians everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words as I boldly explain God's secret plan that the good news is for the Gentiles too. I'm in chains now for preaching this message as God's ambassador, but pray that I will keep on speak, speaking boldly for him as I should. Here ends the reading. So I pray that, um, just as Paul prayed, that God give me the right words as I preach in his name this morning. Amen. So yeah, we have been looking at the theme of wisdom quite a lot recently in the sermons, especially last week, perhaps, as we were talking about Solomon. And today I kind of want to continue with that as a theme of a ref my reflection, which is on a, a situation that's all too prevalent at the moment. Um, and I'm also including a little bit of the Ephesians reading that you've just heard, which is a really powerful reading about how we need to stand strong and stand against the evil in the world by putting on the armour of God. So the thing I want to talk about this Sunday are all of those scams, all of those people who try to trick us into giving money. They're happening all the time and everywhere. Hardly a day goes by, I think, when we don't have something that's dodgy. Whether you're getting an email that's pretending it's from me, uh, asking you to buy gift cards or something like that, now you need to know I'm never going to do that, don't you? You know I'm never going to do that. Um, but you, if you look at the, the sender's email address, unless it's mine, smilne at bc.anglican.ca, just delete it, don't answer it, throw it away, it's not from me. Could be that. Or it might be a text message telling you that you've got unpaid bills which must be paid immediately using this link. And then you're supposed to click the link and send money. And then we all know where that's going to go. Scams like that are easy to spot. I quite often get, get messages coming into me reminding me to pay my parking fines. I don't have a car. Then last week I had one reminding me that if I didn't pay my speeding ticket soon, I'd be in trouble. I can't push the parish wheelbarrow that fast. I get other ones telling me that unless I do something quick, they're going to, they're going to suspend my Netflix account. I haven't got a Netflix account. And then there's many coming my way which tell me if I don't do something quick by clicking this link, my parcel that I've ordered from Amazon will be returned to the warehouse. I don't shop online. 
My lifestyle protects me from many, many of these scams that I, I don't fall for because they're clearly not right. Having said that, others are less easy to recognize. And both churches as organizations and Christians as individuals seem to be particularly targeted. Often they are targeted at people of faith specifically. Um, and I'm fi I find that actually really very interesting. Because it seems to me that even in this secular world that we're living in now, that's, that's many, many people, strangers to Christianity, they still have this idea, even amongst thieves and scammers, that Christians are good people. They're known for their kindness and their generosity. They're known for charity and love and care for the needy. And therefore, some of these people see us as vulnerable and easy targets. Not sure it should be that way. Not if you keep reading those readings like the one in Ephesians, where we're supposed to stand up against the evil in the world, because the evil is not just the flesh and blood that are throwing things like this at us. It's the evil powers and authorities behind them that's causing them to do it, that the battle is against. Now we know, don't we, that there have always been people in the world who abuse the kindness of others to their own advantage. This isn't new. I remember many years ago, my goodness, it must be 10 years ago, no more. Ooh, 15 years ago, maybe, maybe even more than that. Yeah, more than that must be oh, like 20 years ago. I remember chatting with a homeless guy in Aberystwyth. It's a long time since I was around that area. And after listening to him and trying to understand what his needs were and what it was like to live on the streets. Um, I asked him, um, so what's the best thing that he could tell me if I wanted to help somebody who's living on, who's homeless living on the streets? And his answer wasn't what I was expecting or, or what I was looking for. He said, you need to look at their shoes. Okay, well, unless they're wearing Doc Martens, I might not be interested in their shoes. But he said, well, no, this is how it is. If their shoes are worn and dirty and it looks like they've been wearing them for a long time, they need help, give them something. But if their shoes look clean and smart, they're just pretending to be homeless. Don't give them a thing. So it turns out there were people spending their days on the streets of Aberystwyth, sitting on the sidewalk, asking for money, who were abusing the kindness of strangers because they, weren't, they were only pretending to be homeless. And at the same time, of course, they were taking advantage of the rough sleepers who really did need money and help because they were taking the money that otherwise might have been given to them. And the guy I was talking about was really steamed about this. He, he wasn't happy. So I, I still think about that quite often. But at the time, I remember thinking about it and coming up with two conclusions. First of all, there's got to be something wrong with the person who chooses, who gets up out of his own bed in his own house in the morning, gets up and, and the best thing he can think of to do that day is to sit on the sidewalk and beg in Aberystwyth. There must be something wrong with that person's life that that's the best thing that they can do, even if they do have to, a bed to go home and sleep in that night. The second conclusion I came to is that I would actually rather take the risk of helping somebody who didn't really need it rather than miss the people that did. And so in that circumstance, I decided I'm, I'm happy occasionally to get conned or scammed because I don't want to miss the person who's in desperate need. In Matthew's Gospel, they have Jesus say, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, being wise as serpents in these circumstances isn't as easy as all that. Because scammers aren't just people we might come across when we're out and about, when we're walking on the street. They are in our emails. They call us on the phone, they send text messages, they use almost every kind of communication you can imagine. They're all there everywhere. So how do we be wise as serpents among the wolves when we are still called to help those who are in need? 
Now, a while ago, it must have been quite a while ago now, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, the phone rang in the church house and I answered it and there was a man called Paul on the phone. Poor guy. He told me a terrible story of his being married to an alcoholic wife. They split up and then he fought for custody of their child and he managed to get custody. And then he said he'd found a job offer on the island where I live um, and he was driving across, bringing his child with him, he was driving across Canada when his car broke down. And he was calling me because he needed money to fix the car, he needed money for a hotel, otherwise the child would have nowhere to sleep tonight. So he needed the money right now. In addition, he said his furniture and possessions were all being held by the removal company because the check he'd written to pay for the move had bounced and they wouldn't release his goods back to him. So he, there he was, stuck with nothing in the middle of Canada, with nothing except a child. Now, I tried to interrupt him and make comments occasionally in this conversation, but clearly it wasn't a conversation at all because it was almost as if if he'd said anything, he would have said, don't interrupt me, I'm in the middle of my script. <laughs> and he didn't want to engage with anything. He just plowed on and on with his story. And he even tried to convince me that we'd met. Somehow, even though he was traveling from the other side of Canada, he'd been in my church not so very long ago, he said. Um, and he wanted to speak with me then, but he didn't get the chance because there were so many other people wanting to speak with me. Well, you know, our church isn't that busy. It would be nice if it was true that there was that many people um, wanting to speak to me. It certainly is fairly easy to spot a stranger in the church. And I hadn't seen anybody that could have been Paul there. Um, but he assured me that he would, well, as soon as he got to the island, he'd be coming back and he'd be joining my church. Isn't that lovely, a new parishioner? So anyway, he spun this story. And I can't help but chuckle sometimes because the story he span was quite similar to my own story. Only maybe my own story maybe was worse. I don't know. So um, I too had escaped from a, an alcoholic husband in my case, and he was all, but he was also a drug addict. And I got out of that marriage with not just one kid, but five. And I too came all the way, not just across Canada, but halfway across the world for a job on the island. And also my furniture and possessions also got tangled up for months on end, um, not because I didn't pay the bill, but because of um, paperwork to do with immigration and some other things. And so I was living with nothing except, pretty much nothing except what I'd arrived with in my suitcase for months on end. So my story was the same, but may, maybe worse. And the other thing about this was Paul had called me two years before with exactly the same sad and sorry tale. His child was still the same age. I think it was seven years old. It had been seven years old two years before, and it was still seven years old now. His car was broken down in exactly the same part of Canada as it was two years ago. And yes, he'd been to our church again and again. I was far too busy talking to the throngs in our building to be able to speak to him. And he was still going to join the church when he arrived. So Paul wasn't a real person at all. And I pondered all of that as well. And I guess you could say there were four questions that came to me as I thought about it. First of all, when and why did Christians become easy targets for con men and scammers? When did we stop standing up against these things? When did we forget that we are as sheep in the midst of wolves and need to be wise as serpents and yet still be innocent as doves? I remember Solomon in last week's reading how he was exercising his God-given gift of wisdom and he was exercising it against those who had tried to con and manipulate both him and his father David and eventually they were put to the sword. Third question, when did Jesus ever tell us just to hand out money to sob story people or give gift cards to random emailers or the equivalent in the first century without any discernment or wisdom or coming alongside or relationship growing? Well, Jesus did tell us to clothe the naked, which we do through the Blessings Boutique where we give out clothes to those who need them. And I could have taken some with, with me. I went to Hornby Island with a friend this last week and found myself 
unexpectedly on a nudist beach. I didn't take my clothes off or anything like that. You're all right, but I should have taken some, shouldn't I, to clothe the naked there? They might not have wanted them, but they, they could have had them anyway. Jesus also told us, <laughs> oh dear, I don't know why I go off on these things. Jesus also told us to feed the hungry. And again, we do at St. Peter's, we have the community lunch. We have the food bank that runs out of our office. And we also manage the community food shelf down on Comox Avenue. He tells us to give to the poor. But Jesus also saw through people's words and looked straight at their heart. Next week's gospel reading has Jesus say, it is from within the human heart that evil intentions come, avarice, wickedness, deceit. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So we are to resist evil intention, whether those intentions are arising from our own heart or whether they're coming at us from others. And so my fourth question is, why is that image of kindness and love and charity and therefore vulnerability of Christians, why is it that that remains in people's minds in the secular world that we live in? Whilst the idea that we are protected by an almighty God, a God of power and might is with us and will stand, stand with us against the evil in the world, that has vanished. They forget or they don't care that God is a God of loving judgment, but a God of judgment all the same. A God to be feared, that is, to be held in respect and reverence and awe. People like Paul should stand in fear before representatives of Christ who have the power of God with us. We are champions of right and wrong. We are armed with the discernment of good and evil, just like Solomon. What I could have said to Paul on the phone was something like, well, excuse me, sir, but your sin is showing, or get a bit more Bible bashing and say, repent, because you need to turn to the Lord, <laughs> repent of your evil ways. I didn't do either of those things. If I remember rightly, I just said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't believe what you're telling me. You phoned me before and I'm not going to give you anything. <laughs> Maybe we've become wishy-washy and are living out of the call of God in scripture. Maybe we're just choosing the comfortable bits that make us feel good, such as clothing the naked and feeding the hungry. That's great stuff. Maybe we've just forgotten that there's other things that we're called to do, stand firm and strong against evil. Now there is something we can and we must do for people like Paul and all those who try to scam or harm us. We can pray for them because if we've got it wrong and if this is a person of genuine need, then Christ somehow, Christ and the Holy Spirit, they can come to these people through prayer and they can help them. They can find them what they need. And Lord, I pray that we can be those people that you, you utilize to answer prayer of others in other, for, for other ways and in other circumstances. And if they're not people of genuine need, then turn to the Psalms and remember what praying for our enemies looks like. It looks like destroying them and casting them down. This is what the Psalms say, pray to cast down and destroy the, our enemies. Because I can't help thinking that it's in those moments where they're cast down, that that's where they might look to God. It's, maybe it's there when they fail in their scamming, where they, they're not getting anywhere, that maybe they'll hear the voice of God. I don't know. In today's Ephesians reading, Paul, the real Paul, the Apostle Paul, not the dodgy Paul, he encourages the Ephesian church to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. He says, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way, all the evil that comes at you. And I'll remind you what the, the whole armor of God consists of. The belt 
of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, of the proclamation of good news, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And he says, we should pray at all times, even for those who would try to scam us, even for our enemies, and those prayers don't have to be pretty. So we are then to be like warriors in the world, warriors dressed in armor, which is both for protection and for the fight. And so we who are armed with wisdom, with the full armor of God and with the power of prayer behind us, are not supposed to become soft-bellied targets for the enemies of the truth, but we are to stand strong in the Lord. We should be champions of peace and justice and of love and to be able to discern between what is good and what is not. And if we discern that it's not, stand strong. So I've spoken in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right, so um, next week there will be a video and I'll be in it, but I'm not going to be the preacher because we have a special service next week with a guest preacher and I've already told him I'm going to be filming his sermon in advance. So my online congregation, you, you lovely people there, will be able to hear that sermon. Even better, you could come to church next Sunday, which is the first, well, it's the 32nd of August because we're having a fifth Sunday style service, but it's actually the 1st of September. It's going to be a celebratory service with a meal to follow. I'm not going to say what we're celebrating online, but um, we will be celebrating and there's a corn roast to follow. So the service begins at 11. Lo lovely time. The music's going to be great because I've chosen it. So I've chosen some of my favourite songs. Not that the music's not always great, but I'll, I'll be having a great time singing along this week. Um, and then as soon as that's finished, I can't give you an exact time. Service is about an hour, an hour and a half, and then we'll all have a corn roast meal together and a time for food and fellowship. So yeah, you will be very, very welcome to be at St. Peter's for that. So if you need more information about how to find us or any other changes in our services or how to get in touch with the Blessings Boutique or the Food Bank or anything like that, you can find on our webpage, which is stpeterscomox.ca. So it's been lovely to be with you again and hopefully You'll see me and my preacher, whose name is uh, Reverend Peter Ratcliffe, next week. And uh, until then, God bless you. Bye for now.